So, um, last talk of the day. Um, thanks everyone for sticking around. I'd like to present Sofiane Jerby. So, Sofiane is someone I've got the pleasure of knowing person at least a little bit. He did his uh, PhD in Innsbruck with Hans Briegel, co-supervised from Bedram Dunker, so we overlapped at Leiden occasionally. Uh, and he's currently at a postdoc in Berlin with Jens Leifler. Thanks, Sophia. Yeah, thanks for the kind introduction, Tom. So today I'll be telling you about uh, this project um, I did in my time in uh, Innsbruck in collaboration with uh, Arjen Kornelissen, Maris Ogos from QSoft, and Veteran Danschke from University of Leiden. So yeah, uh, our project uh, is set in, uh, in reinforcement learning. For, so for those of you that don't know what reinforcement learning is, I'll just introduce it in one slide. So this is one paradigm of machine learning that considers uh, learning agents that learn how to perform a task uh, by interacting with an environment. So an example of an environment can be, for instance, a game of chess. And then uh, the agent, by interacting with this game, for instance, it will see a configuration of uh, a board, move a piece uh, through an action, and then get a reward uh, when it wins or loses the game. Uh, it will try to learn how to play this game. Uh, so this interaction of state actions reward will be a cyclic interaction that we usually divide in terms of episodes. So in a game of chess, this is quite straightforward. Um, and we will model the policy by so-called uh, probability distribution, uh, policy, sorry, which is a probability distribution over actions given states. Uh, and the goal of the agent will be to learn the policy that will maximize its rewards uh, in an average interaction. Uh, so, but th since these rewards are spread out in an episode, the actual figure of merit you will look at here is a so-called uh, value function, uh, which is nothing but the average sum of rewards that the agent will perceive in an environment by starting in a state at zero and then following its policy uh, pi, therefore. So these are the two main quantities, the policy and the figure of merit, the value function. So when we talk about quantum reinforcement learning, there are different scenarios we can consider depending on whether the agent or the environment are quantum or classical in nature. Uh, in this talk, I will be focusing on these two, um, two, environments, uh, two settings sorry, at the bottom. Uh, the core of our, of our algorithms are in this talk are set in the quantum accessible scenario. Uh, but I'll start by introducing some recent developments in the quantum enhanced setting, as they also link well to the algorithms that we will talk about. So let's start with the quantum enhanced reinforcement learning. But for that, let's see the recent developments in deep reinforcement learning. Well, uh, arguably one of the biggest breakthroughs about reinforcement learning in the last few years was the advent of deep reinforcement learning, or using deep neural networks to design reinforcement learning agents. That was initiated by this work uh, in 2015 of this Atari playing uh, reinforcement learning agents. Uh, and the big success for this was the use of a convolutional neural network to uh, decide the actions of, of, the, of the agent. Uh, and an idea that was recently explored is uh, replace these uh, uh, neural networks by their quantum analog, which are so-called primary choice quantum circuits, and therefore we end up in a quantum enhanced setting. So in the last few years, uh, we have explored this idea and also uh, concurrently other uh, teams have also uh, looked into the similar idea of using parameterized quantum circuits to design reinforcement learning agents. And this is especially appealing for the near term. As you can see in this learning algorithm or this framework, the only thing that is quantum in nature is the use of a parameterized quantum circuits that replaces a deep neural network here. And you can see a parameterized quantum circuit essentially as a parameterized quantum computation that takes as input the state of the agent, some parameters theta, and will output the policy uh, of the agent. And then everything else, the learning algorithm here is still classical in nature. And it's the same in the one we use for a deep neural network. So let's look, look a bit closer into how we can define policies out of parameterized quantum circuits. Well, the actual architecture that we end up using to design these uh, circuits is not very important. What's really important is how we can use these measurements at the output of the circuit to define a probability distribution over actions, given the state that is taken here as input. So naturally, this uh, measurement in the computational basis was defined as some probability distribution over computational basis states. Let's say we want to design a policy that is acting on three actions. Well, the natural way to define a policy is just to divide the full space into three subspaces. And then when we measure a certain computational me measurement, we just perform the action corresponding to that uh, subspace. So mathematically, this defines what we call a raw uh, PQC policy, which is nothing but the expectation value of a projection on a subspace um, 
with respect to this quantum state of the output of, um, of the parameter quantum circuit. So the one problem or drawback with this type of policy, so it's quite nice because with one sample you can sample from your policy, one run of the circuit you can sample from your policy, but the problem is it kind of uh, lacks in terms of flexibility in making this distribution more peaked independently of the state you are in, which is quite interesting in reinforcement learning. So one idea is to, instead of using the quantum circuit once to sample from the policy, we will do repeated measurements to evaluate these expectation values, and then we will multiply them by some trainable weights, uh, omega or w, and then apply a softmax to renormalize this whole thing, and we end up with what we call a softmax PQC policy. And the idea is that these additional trainable parameters, they will allow you to make your distribution more peaked and have a more greedy policy, so to speak. So as, as it turns out, we've, we've tested both of these policies, and what we find out is that on benchmark environments, and what we find out is that for the same architecture of the parameterized quantum circuit, uh, the softmax PQC will indeed outperform uh, the raw PQC, as in it will learn faster the optimal uh, policy. So this is uh, what I had to say about quantum enhanced reinforcement learning. Let's now dig into the core, which is the quantum accessible reinforcement learning setting. So the question that we're really asking here is, what can we gain in terms of learning advantage when we allow an agent and environment to, elect, to interact quantumly? So maintain a coherent interaction uh, of state, action, and reward. So what does it mean? A best way to visualize uh, an agent, interaction, an agent environment interaction for me is in the form of a tree. Uh, and essentially the interaction we start in the initial state as zero, that is given by the environment. Then the agent will sample an action A0 in that state according to its policy. And then the, re the agent will again respond with a reward and sample a new state. And effectively in one given interaction, we are, we are sampling one trajectory in, uh, in this tree. And so a general, this is what you do classically, but a general extension of this uh, reward and probability transition um, oracles to the quantum setting uh, is just essentially a probability oracle for the trans state transition oracle. So this is just a sampling access. And then for the reward oracle, a very natural one is just the binary oracle uh, that gives the reward in a state, uh, state action pair. So also we will consider policies that can be implemented coherently, meaning that we can somehow implement quantum samples of this policy. This is, for instance, gonna be very natural for the raw PQC policies we talked about, but also more general policies. And essentially what is quite interesting when we have access to these uh, two oracles and this policy map is that we can now essentially sample or prepare a superposition of all paths uh, in the tree. Um, and this is gonna be quite useful for the quantum algorithms that we will use. So there have been previous work in this quantum accessible reinforcement learning framework. Um, as an example, uh, people have looked into algorithms to find the optimal policy in a general framework of Markov decision processes. Um, and um, yeah, the, what they, what we call optimal policies are those essentially that maximize uh, the value function. Uh, but the drawback of these uh, algorithms is that they will have a time and sample complexity that will essentially scale as the size of the state and action space. Uh, so linearly or the square root. And in real world environments, like imagine for instance the game of chess, the size of the state space is just all possible configurations of the game is gigantic. So these algorithms are not very interesting for real world problems or real world applications of reinforcement learning. On the other hand, we also know that in uh, agents that, allow, that have quantum access to the environment uh, can exhibit even to up to exponential speed ups in learning times compared to agents that only have classical access to the environment. Uh, and the problem with, well, this is already quite an interesting theoretical finding, but the problem with it is that these environments are completely artificial and they are, for instance, based on uh, Simon's problem which exhibits already a exponential speed up, and we don't really know how to make the speed ups applicable for actual practical reinforcement learning. So the real question that motivated us for this project is, can we get um, quantum speed ups for really state of the art or real world reinforcement learning? Uh, and for that, uh, our work is situated in the policy gradient training. Uh, so as a reminder, this is the figure of merit that we try to maximize when we, um, when we train our reinforcement learning agent. 
uh, it's the value function. And in policy gradient training, the, um, the, na the, yeah, the approach that we take is a naive optimization approach where we just do essentially gradient ascent on this value function. So thetas here are the parameters of the policy and we will simply update them in the direction that maximize the reward greedily. And the question we ask in this quantum policy gradient algorithms is whether we can estimate these gradients uh, faster through quantum access to the environment. And here it's, uh, it's important to notice that there are two types of algorithms to estimate these, these gradients of the value function. One we call the analytic policy gradient algorithm, which essentially uses an expression of this gradient of the value function, which similarly to the value function is just an expectation value over all trajectories in the tree of a quantity that is not just the sum of rewards, but also these additional terms, which are the gradients of the log policy. Uh, and this actually is an exact uh, evaluation of this, um, of this gradient. On the other hand, we have something that is maybe also quite natural, which is just to do a numerical evaluation of this gradient. And here, uh, essentially what you do is you perturb your parameters with uh, some parameter uh, delta, you evaluate your value function, you compare that to the value function which is not perturbed, and this difference will kind of reveal you the, the gradient of, of, of your value function. And our quantum algorithms will speed up both of these approaches, the analytical and the numerical approach. So we'll start by describing uh, the quantum algorithm for the analytical policy gradient method. And as I just told you, this is just an expectation value over trajectories. So the, the core task that we have here is that of a Monte Carlo estimation. But the real specificity is here that this random variable is not one dimensional. We have a gradient, so this thing is in the dimension of the number of parameters um, in, the, that's in the policy. Uh, so this is essentially a Monte Carlo estimation of a d dimensional random variable. So to state this problem more formally, is just that we have a random variable of dimension d. We're gonna assume it to be bounded in some p norm, where uh, p is larger than one, and we want to estimate the expectation value of this random variable here in the affinity norm. So this problem is very well understood when the dimension d is equal to one. We, we, we know very well what the classical capacity is, we know that we can get a quadratic speed up using amplitude estimation, but Actually, it turns out that before we looked into it, there wasn't much investigation of the d-dimensional variant. Um, and so classically, the d-dimensional variant is also very well uh, known, um, the complexity is very well known. Uh, the number of samples of x, we need to estimate this expectation value to precision epsilon scales as b squared over epsilon squared. And importantly, this is only a logarithmic dependence on d, right? This comes from Hafting and the union bound. But what turns out is that the quantum complexity uh, so we indeed get a quadratic speed up in B and over epsilon, as in the one dimensional case. But on top of this, we get a slowdown in the dimension D of the random variable. And this slowdown will depend on the P that is um, bounding the, the P norm of, of, of X. So in the case where, in the limit where P equal infinity, this, uh, we have a square root of D slowdown compared to the classical method. Uh, but interestingly, when P is less or equal than two, um, we can actually f get a full quadratic speed up. In, in that sense, we have a logarithmic in D dependence now. So, and what we show in, in these papers is that the overhead for P equal infinity of this square root D is unavoidable in, a, in one related setting where the estimate is in two error, L2 error, not L infinity error. So now, just by taking this, this algorithm that we defined before, we can straightforwardly apply it for the policy grade, for the policy gradient theorem uh, expression of the, of the gradient by taking essentially our random variable to be this uh, sum of rewards weighted by the gradient of the log probability, uh, log policy, and then implementing quantum sampling access to this, to this uh, random variable is quite straightforward. As I told you, you can create this proposition over all paths with these oracles that we defined before, and evaluating this, uh, this random variable is also very straightforward. So now we have essentially uh, that the quantum and the classical complexity are governed by this quantity, which is the, governed by the P norm of the gradient of the log policy. And in a couple of slides, I will give you an example of a, um, of a policy where we can actually bound this quantity. But overall, uh, this has, we, yeah, we, we get the same complexities that we have here in terms of speed up. So now, with respect to this uh, other type of um, policy gradient evaluation method, 
uh, we have the numerical estimation method. And this actually, the, most, the more general uh, setting is really that you have probability oracle access to some function, um, which uh, takes as input a d-dimensional uh, vector and outputs a value between zero and one, and you want to estimate this gradient. So this problem has been investigated, uh, yeah, a few years ago. Uh, and these authors, what they realize is that in order to get guarantees of speed up in estimating this gradient, you also need to impose some smoothness conditions on this function S that you want to estimate the gradient of. Uh, and the, exactly the specific types of condition they look into are these Jevery conditions, which uh, essentially bound the magnitude of the kth order derivatives of F uh, as a function that uh, scales like this for some parameters sigma, M, and C. Right? And the complexities that they find in order to estimate these gradients are essentially the following, where, again, you have a speed up in terms of, a quadratic speed up in terms of M, C, and epsilon, but you indeed, depending on sigma, you will have to pay also for a uh, potential, um, no, either no speed up or a quadratic speed up uh, in D, right? So for D less or equal than one half, you will get a full quadratic speed up in all parameters, and for uh, sigma larger than that, you will uh, not have any speed up in D. Okay, so again, we can straightforwardly apply this numerical gradient estimation uh, algorithm for our setting. So here, the function f that we look at is just uh, the value function, right? Um, and we can very straightforwardly uh, implement a probability oracle to this f, which is the value function, uh, simply by, again, using the interaction with the environment in superposition, and then all you have to do in order to get really the, the pr probability oracle to the, um, to the value function is just take an ancilla qubit and then encode the sum of rewards in its amplitudes, and then you'll end up straightforwardly with a probability oracle. Um, and actually the crux of our proof here was to show that for Markov decision processes, or so general type of reinforcement learning environments, um, the value function that we look at satisfies these Jevre conditions I told you about before, and specifically for a sigma equal to zero. Uh, and the other parameters that you see here are, well, this one is a, this parameter D is a mouthful of a parameter, but all it does is essentially characterize the smoothness of the policy we're looking at. But importantly, since the sigma is equal to zero here, it's less than one half, so we again get a full quadratic speed up uh, in, uh, in quantum complexity compared to the classical complexity. So, okay, now I presented to you these two algorithms, and both of them have these uh, constants that are a bit hard to uh, make sense of, like for instance this D in this algorithm, but the, also the norm of the gradient of the log policy in the analytical algorithm. Uh, and actually, yeah, you may wonder when are these actually nicely behaved? Uh, and what I find really cool uh, about this project is that we can give explicitly this uh, raw PQC and soft PQC uh, policies that we defined in the quantum enhanced setting as examples where these two constants are very nicely behaved. So for instance, in the raw PQC policy, we have that the D in the numerical estimation subroutine uh, is bounded by one. And this is essentially a result of the parameter shift rule, if you, if you know of this, uh, extended to higher order derivatives, which tell us that essentially all raw PQC policies are very smooth, even to high order. Um, and uh, regarding the uh, analytical grain estimation subroutine, where here when we look at softmax PQC policies, uh, where we somehow restrict them a bit by fixing all the parameters that are inside the circuit and only letting these weights here parameterize uh, the policy. Uh, what you find in that setting is that you can enforce this gradient of the log policy to be bounded in one norm. Um, and so overall what this results in is a full quadratic speed up for numerical estimation for raw PQC policies and a full quadratic speed up in article gradient estimation for um, softmax PQC policies. So that concludes the, the results that we have. Um, the remaining open questions that we have is essentially that here in this work, we only compared our quantum algorithms to the best known uh, classical algorithms we know of. Uh, so it would be very nice to find matching uh, lower bounds uh, for these classical complexities. 
Um, so these problems of multivariate Monte Carlo estimation have matching uh, lower bounds on their own. Uh, for numerical gradient estimation, um, there may be some as well. Um, and it would be very nice to leverage them to be applied to this poly policy gradient uh, estimation problem. Um, and also in our analysis of the smoothness of the value function, we also seem to not be very tight in the smooth analysis, um, and it would be very nice to try to extend that. So with this, I would like to conclude my talk and uh, thank my collaborator for this very nice work. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Sofian. Do we have any questions? Hi, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on uh, the constraints given on the action space. So you mentioned uh, for uh, when you sample from your policy that you can sample a, a discrete probability distribution. Uh, have you explored uh, the possibilities of doing a continuous action space? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, the question is, uh, regarding these policies, we define them as discrete action spaces, so we essentially assign subsets of the computational basis uh, states to some actions, uh, and whether we could extend this to real valued actions. Well, one, we haven't done this, but one very straightforward where, way of doing that is essentially um, have um, the, sorry, um, yeah, the action that is chosen to be dependent on the expectation value of an observable measured at the output of the parameterized quantum circuit. So the expectation value will be real valued. They can assign probably a, a continuous action to that. Um, but I'm not sure of what constraints you need to put on this of these observables in order for it to be properly normalized. So that would need to be investigated more. So I know there are works in progress about using continuous valued uh, actions, uh, applying this method in continuous, with continuous actions, but I'm not totally sure. I would assume it's something like this. Uh, you got any other question? All right, well, I don't have anything either. In that case, let's thank the speaker for a fantastic talk, and all the other speakers. And... Gracias.